Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today's episode focuses on advocacy and diplomacy, the ability for change, looking at human rights and the rule of law for all. And today, we're looking at the University of New South Wales Diplomacy Training Program, and we're joined by Michael. Michael, thank you so much for participating today. A uh, real pleasure to be here, Josh. What first inspired you to get involved with the diplomacy training program and share a bit about the exciting advocacy work that you do? Yeah, very happy to do that. Um, I was giving a presentation to students at the University of New South Wales about pro bono in law firms, which is my, my day job is in a large law firm in Australia. Um, and I was sitting next to a person by the name of Patrick Earle, um, who was also speaking to those students about um, other opportunities in the pro bono and human rights space. And when I heard um, Patrick's presentation, uh, I, I immediately said to him, um, my firm has to work with DTP as, you know, as much as we can. How can we support you? Um, what the Diplomacy Training Program does is it gives human rights advocates uh, right throughout the Asia-Pacific region, which um, we interpret very broadly from, you know, Fiji all the way through to, say, Lebanon, um, with the tools to make change in their own communities and their own countries. Um, and we give them training in the UN um, system and how to make a difference within the UN system. That's really the foundation of DTP's um, story. And we also um, give them specific topic training. So we've done um, topics such as migrant workers, the rights of the child, uh, the rights of women, um, environmental causes, um, and particularly Indigenous rights throughout the region as well. The other thing that the Diplomacy Training Program does incredibly well is link all of the people who come to our programs with like-minded civil society advocates right throughout the region um, and with the um, diplomacy core of uh, many of the major nations um, in, in, uh, who, who have embassies right throughout the region, so Australia, the USA, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Switzerland, many of the European countries, as well as each other's embassies as well. Um, we were founded by um, President, as he again is, um, Dr. Jose Ramos Horta, uh, the, the current president of Timor Leste. Uh, and we were founded at the University of New South Wales when uh, Jose was uh, in Australia as a refugee um, during the Indonesian occupation of Timor. And he was struggling to find a way to communicate um, the people of Timor-Leste's plight to the world. Um, and, and through another one of our pioneers, um, the late uh, Dr. Garth Netheim, found an ally um, who um, stood with him and um, together they worked to promote the interests of, um, firstly, the, the people of Timor-Leste, but then they founded the Diplomacy Training Program to give those skills to other civil society advocates throughout the region. So that's a, a synopsis of the DTP. We're now about 33 years old and we have um, tens of thousands of alumni right throughout the region, um, many of whom are doing, well, most of whom are doing incredible things um, in the civil society space, but also many of whom have gone in to serve their countries um, in, in their foreign affairs cause, in the diplomatic cause, or in their government program. No, it's exciting to see, really, because it's an example of each one teach one. And with President, again, Jose Ramos Horta, in his role, he really shares the stories of how he did that. But then also still writing, still doing advocacy work, still involved. It wasn't just one job. It was a joy. And it is exciting as they're coming up on independence for a quarter of a century that still they host the meetings, they have the annual program there, and maybe you can share a bit about what other courses are coming up and how people can be involved. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, first of all, a plug for our website, 
um, which is um, uh, dtp.org.au, um, and that will give you the full um, list of our, our upcoming programs. There's a really exciting one coming up in, in May in Thailand, which is going to be a coming together of um, a number of civil society leaders and advocates throughout the region to discuss how best human rights can be taught and advanced throughout the um, throughout the Asia Pacific region. Um, what's working in human rights and, and sort of capacity building in the human rights space? What's not working? Um, what um, you know, we as the DTP can do to facilitate um, the advancement of, of human rights and human rights advocacy um, in that space, and also the advancement of um, democracy in in that area. Because um, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, those two things are linked. Um, and when you see a deterioration in the rule of law and and, and democracy in countries, you also see a deterioration in human rights. So how we can support um, those things, um, you know, as we get into the middle of the 21st century um, and how we can support the people who are on the ground um, advocating for um, change in their countries. It's really cool because this is the year where almost half of humanity votes and participates in government. And we know that really human rights education is at the core of creating that culture of rule of law and advancing what is most important to the people. And one of the skills and ex ex excellent experiences that happens with DTP is number one, there is the course, there are the trainings, there is the sharing of that knowledge of the UN system, the human rights charter and the treaty bodies, but also that peer to peer solidarity that's built through the participants and how they then fuel each other and help each other as they focus on fundamental freedoms. Maybe you could share a bit as well about the annual program that's coming up in Timor-Leste and how that usually coincides also with the celebration or commemoration of the independence of the nation from really colonial times with Portugal and the Netherlands. But then, as you were sharing earlier, that 25-year stretch of the brutal occupation in Indonesia and how then Timor-Leste was able to be have Jose Ramos Horta be at the UN on a daily basis work to make sure the world understood the plight of his people and then make sure that they could then create a country that's built on democracy and ensuring that that dignity of all of its people are upheld and promoted. Yeah. Look at our annual program. I mean, I'll, let, let me just check the date of the annual program. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in August this year. Yeah. Is, um, it, it's a wonderful thing. It, it really is a celebration of... Um, human rights and civil society building in a country um, that that is rare in the sense that um, it is founded on the very principles that, that we teach and discuss in the annual program. Um, and the people who come to the annual program um, inevitably get to meet and spend time with um, President Ramos Horta. Um, Jose is a force of nature and a lot of fun um, and has some really great stories about his time as a civil society advocate and also his time as a teacher in the diplomacy training program um, and, and some of the things that, that um, you know, he got up to when he was teaching human rights around the region. The, um, but, but you're right, it, it's, it coincides with a celebration of Timor Leste's independence um, and, and it really is a moving time to be in Timor Leste um, from a, you get a sense that the country just has so much hope and so much potential, and when you're there for a celebration like this, you really see it come to the fore. And the people there are, um, you know, committed to their democracy, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and you know, there there's been several successful transitions of power, um, and um, you know, like any politics, not everybody sees eye to eye. But um, everybody does um, seem to work in the political space for the benefit of the country and the benefit of its people. And that's really, you know, the, the sort of thing that um, DTP does celebrate. Um, and also we work with some of the, um, the local civil society organisations, um, the Justice Monitoring Program, 
um, inevitably partners with us and they do wonderful things in making sure that um, the rule of law in Timor-Leste r- remains at the forefront of, of how the country is governed. And that's a, you know, that, that's a remarkable thing. And, and the people um, who work with that organisation um, are really a credit to both the organisation and the nation. We also get in some fabulous teachers, um, possibly yourself, Josh. Um, and, and, you know, along with, um, I mean, I think last time I was there, Virginia Dan Dan, who's one of the um, UN Special Rapporteurs, um, came out and taught um, several of the faculty from the University of New South Wales, uh, came out and taught. And it really is, you know, great to hear these experienced perspectives from people who've been in the human rights and civil society field for, for their entire careers, making change and passing on what's worked for them to the next generation of civil society advocates. No, what you shared reminds me of so many points that we could go into. You know, number one, Timor Leste being there on the ground, you really do, it makes you reflect on what we have in the countries that are democracies, how fragile it is, but also how vibrant it is and how many people around the world still are striving for those basic human rights and fundamental freedoms. And you you see that in the face of the people in Timor, that they've been able to secure it and how sacred it is and that they'll do everything to maintain that. The other aspect, of course, that you share is the participants. The participants are, are so inspiring because they're doing so much work there. And the work that they're doing at home, they take a couple weeks out of their time and then are able to go back and apply exactly what they've learned. And then that last part that you're sharing really of looking at the, the, the trainers, the trainers are, are not people who are sages on stages who talk about something, but who are actually involved in and serving on UN bodies who are actually doing the work and then are able to almost plug the youth into the processes right away and be able to then take from what they've been doing at home at the community level and in their capitals to the global civil society, and then be able to utilize these United Nation mechanisms to make a difference at their home and see yeah. those changes happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the students are the most inspiring part of, of these programs. You learn so much um, from them. You gain so much from their energy. The, um, you know, the commitment they have to making their communities a better place is, is really inspiring. And um, when they get a chance to meet other people who are doing the same thing, um, they just rebound off each other for, you know, the entire program. Um, their ideas get better. Their methods get better. Um, they learn as much from each other as, as they do from the trainers. Um, and, and they just develop and join this great network that is the diplomacy training program of people who um, they can stay in contact with share their experiences with, um, teach and learn from. It's true. There's this exponential engagement. There's this sense of you can see people connect in a couple of ways. I, I know people connect on on passionate issues such as West Papua, but they're also doing things similar at home and where they thought maybe they were alone before and the only one by meeting the other participants, they're, they realize they're part of this larger family that's focusing on freedom and also more importantly, showing what's possible and and also being in Timor, that sense of solidarity. You would think maybe after 25 years, people would be focusing on making their country better only or focusing inward, but there's that sense of solidarity for Western Sahara, for self-determination for anyone anywhere on earth. They don't forget what they've been through and they wanna make sure that everyone else has that opportunity to fully engage and experience all of their range of human rights that are embodied in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Yeah, absolutely. As we look at those programs and we see what's important going on, maybe could we could look at some of the work that you're doing. You know, you do a lot of pro bono. We know yeah. you show the aspect of what important role lawyers can play and advocates to contribute back to society. What are some of the big topics that you think are most important as we look at human rights education? Certainly. Well, I, I can certainly share some of the things I've done um, 
So I, I'm a partner in a law, law firm called Course Chambers Westgarth, and I'm um, I, I specialize in litigation and cyber security. That's my day job. Um, I also lead uh, the firm's pro bono um, practice in Sydney, along with uh, one of my partners, Mark Payne, and we have a national leader, um, Dr. Phoebe Wynne Pope, who's a well-known um, human rights expert in her own right. Um, We've done some really interesting things um, in um, the areas of Indigenous rights, um, in the areas of uh, the UN um, Special Rapporteur programs, which um, I'm happy to talk about. And um, we're looking at some interesting things as well, including possibly in conjunction with the DTP um, in the area of how cybersecurity and Um, AI and, I suppose, the abuse of human rights online might be addressed um, both for civil society advocates who are the victims of these sorts of things, but also by civil society advocates in their own countries. So that's something interesting that's coming up. Um, So the work that I do ranges from representing people who have problems with access to justice um, and... You know, in, in Australia, like every um, wealthy country, th- there are um, people who just don't have the same access to their rights as the, the rest of the country. And um, our pro bono program um, is very, very passionate about supporting um, people like that and making sure that um, we, we, we would say they get a fair shake of the stick. Um, and... That, that's something that the firm's done um, for the entire 25 years I've been at the firm. The, um, the, the, there's some interesting things that we've done recently in the UN space, um, one of which was to assist an Australian um, human rights advocate, uh, Noel Zimbabwe. Um, Noel is a Rwandan man um, who um, was targeted by the Rwandan government um, he, he's a leader amongst um, the African diaspora in Australia. Um, he was approached by the Rwandan government essentially to spy for them. Um, he declined to do so, and the Rwandan government disappeared um, two of his brothers back in Rwanda. And it's, a, it's an absolutely tragic story. Um, uh, it's, it still makes me quite angry. But we assisted um, Noel in, in conjunction with um, a UK-based Australian barrister, um, Jennifer Robinson, who's um, a, a very well-known um, human rights advocate. Um, we, we assisted Noel, and, and I also should say the Australian Human Rights Institute, led by Justine Nolan, um, who is a, another fabulous um, human rights leader in Australia and a professor at the University of New South Wales and a, a former colleague of mine on the board of the DTP. Um, so together we worked with Noel to bring his case to the UN Special Rapporteur on Enforced Involuntary Disappearances, um, and they've taken up his case and they've made, um, there's been a number of steps um, since we brought that that have drawn attention to the issue of the Rwandan government disappearing political opponents and, you know, people who are even less than political opponents, poets um, and various other innocent people. So. That, that's something that um, the firm has you know, worked on for many years now um, with Noel, um, and it's a you know it, nothing we we do will bring his brothers back, but hopefully we'll find some answers uh, for him and we'll um, make him uh, make his story more well known and, and you know deter the Rwandan government from from this conduct as much as possible. Um, you know, it's a tragic thing um, when governments behave in that manner. Um, We've also recently uh, done a project um, for uh, Leetona Dunge, whose son was killed um, in custody in Australia. Um, Leetona's uh, an Indigenous woman. Her son was an Indigenous man, um, and uh, he was killed um, in Long Bay Jail and there just hasn't been sufficient justice for Latona. So we've um, done some work with her and the National Justice Project, again, in exploring whether these are matters that might be brought before 
um, UN Special Rapporteur programs to shine light on the issues in Australia. Um, David Dungay's death was um, a real Black Lives Matter moment for Australia, and it's um, it, it's an important it's an important issue, and it's important that um, appropriate attention is given um, to the circumstances of his death and the change that need to be made in the Australian system. Uh, we have a terrible history of, of, as we refer to them, black deaths in custody, and uh, it hasn't got better. There have been royal commissions um, you know, many, many years ago, the recommendations of which have never been um, enacted, and it's something that um, governments on all sides of politics have failed to address properly. So that's certainly something that in Australia, um, you know, re requires urgent um, political action at our end and um, would benefit from the international spotlight. And those two examples of really global affairs and ground direct action showed the breadth and depth of what DTP teaches. And the example on Rwanda with the special procedures, I mean, the UN Human Rights Council still has so many amazing independent experts, rapporteurs yeah. and working groups. And by sharing that, the exciting part is students know they don't have to wait to a review happens under one of the treaty bodies, but that they can take immediate action, that they can shine that light and make sure that the world is aware of what's happening. And by you sharing that example in Rwanda, it also highlights what we see around the world of really uh, transnational regression, internal interference by countries in the democracy processes, and really challenging and shrinking that civil society space but pointing out how we can use the global mechanisms to push back to show what's important and then definitely with death in custody and looking at the situation of aboriginal and torres strait islanders it's that everyone can coordinate in their own communities to use these un mechanisms in a way to what patrick can always refer to as sort of like a, a human rights panini or a, a or a burger where you squeeze from the grassroots down where you know the truth but use the global UN mechanisms to kind of squeeze the state and see the truth come out and make sure that what you're doing at the ground matters and that the world, of course, reinforces what you know you're facing, but could be in very difficult, challenging times where it feels like there's never the right answer or that the justice isn't coming about. But your two examples there show what is possible and just give examples of what we can all do together. Yeah, no, that, that, that's right. And it's a, um, it, it's, a, it's a sample of the work the firm has, has done um, but I think they're, they're two issues that have both local and global significance. Um, yeah, the issue of Indigenous deaths in custody is not uh, by any means unique to Australia. Um, every country with a, a minority Indigenous population has the same issue. And I think it's, um, it's important that that is addressed um, you know, locally and globally, uh, so that you know governments of, of all stripes and all types understand that it's just not acceptable. Yeah, and it reminds me, we know the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, CERD, has a history with the Early Warning Urgent Action focusing on Australia, but we know a CERD review is coming up, so it's one of those examples of them being able to coordinate and assist DTP alumni as well as advocates in the country to put pressure on the country to at least kind of pick that low-hanging mango of what's possible that immediately could be done, but also those structural system changes that's possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I know we're getting close, but I know you're also doing some exciting work, and we know advocacy and diplomacy creates that culture of human rights dedicated to inherent dignity and ensures everyone can contribute to a better world in their own community and global civil society. Maybe you could share a bit about your new passion in a way or the new idea because the human rights is never stagnant it's always evolving we could share that new training program you're considering focusing artificial intelligence and online and discuss that way that advocates can dedicate time and skills to serve humanity contribute to that system of rule of law rooted in equality for all yeah yeah no, thanks josh we we are working on um, and I should say it's at the very early stage. I'm very grateful to um, some of the volunteers of the diplomacy training program for pulling this together. But we're working on a concept note in relation to cybersecurity, AI, and human rights. And um, that builds on the UN Global Compact on Digital Rights. One of the 
things that I think law in general, but you know, international law in particular, has difficulty with is any fast-moving environment. And um, there's no doubt that the digital space um, is that. You know, it's um, probably 20 years old um, in, in the form we currently know it, but in those times it's already gone undergone three revolutions um, and we are now, you know, riding the wave of, of a AI-driven revolution as well. And um, in many ways that has enabled and empowered civil society advocates to take direct action, um, sometimes at great personal expense, um, and, and Julian Assange is, is an example of that. Um, but um, it also comes with risks to um, human rights advocates. It also comes with a set of rules or laws that are applied um, inconsistently. And I think what we would like to explore is whether um, a, a program that both promotes um, the rights of um, civil society advocates online and also um, builds a framework for um, the continued role of civil society um, on the internet um, playing their role in moving um, cultures forward. So some of the things we'll look at there are um, cyber security and cyber safety, um, possibly doxing, um, and you know what rules and laws should be applied to that. Australia is currently having a review initiated last week by the Attorney General as to whether um, anti-doxing laws should be strengthened, and that um, comes on the back of um, some doxing of some advocates um, ar arising from um, the, their expression of views on on the tragedy in in Palestine alone. Um, the other areas which I think are interesting is the role of AI, um, whether that's the development of of AI that shares um, views that may be unwelcome or unorthodox in in certain countries, um, but necessary for the development. Of, of civil society, um, you know, you, you can certainly see, and I'm sure it exists already in some countries, versions of AI um, that will not give correct answers about things like human rights, democracy, rule of law. Um, so ensuring that um, those concepts are protected um, as these technologies are developed, I think is very important. And I think it's something that um, we as DTP can assist because of our large, um, I, I suppose, our large footprint across the region will bring many, many perspectives um, to, to this sort of issue. So, as I said, very early stage, um, but something that I'm very, very excited about and I know the DTP is very excited about and I'm hopeful will make its way into a training program sometime soon. It's, it's an exact example of really that, extension and li library of liberation that does exist with DTP, that there's business and human rights courses when business was starting to be seen as an important role with the global compact, but also with the UN, you know, business and human rights framework emerging with the forum, as well as the important aspects of what's going on with the guiding principles, indigenous people's rights, of course, at the core of what DTP does. And so now you're just sharing the latest giant wave that we have to make sure that we can train future generations so that be able to not drown in these new roles, but make sure that the legacy of human rights and rule of law continues going forward. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you with the work that you do on a daily basis in Australia and around the world and sharing a bit about the diplomacy training program here in Hawaii and around the Asia Pacific region. Mahalo. Mahalo, Josh. Thank you.